Alright, time for another draft physics video presentation. Draft science here on YouTube. Uh, I have to add that part. Um, so, Google's evil for lots of reasons. Blah, 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 blah. So, we'll get to the physics. <laughs> yeah. Just pointing it out. Troublemakers. These corporations in charge of things, very bad. Anyway. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> no, I'm only here because this is a monopoly, and <clears throat> as a practical matter, you have to be where the eyeballs are, you know, it's like if you're going to have a protest in your own basement, uh, you're not going to get very far, you know, in terms of having anybody else get interested and join the club and all that kind of crap. Um, so if you have something to say in the world or to the world, there's no point in saying it, you know, out in the middle of the woods. So obviously you have to go where the eyeballs are, or the ears are, and um, <clears throat> so yes, we're stuck using the populist mechanism, and uh, we're allowing these monopoly corporations to control that, which is just really not very smart, not very civilized. <clears throat> so anyway, all right, <clears throat> today will be the atom, um, and that ends up being a lot of subjects. But let's understand, okay, so the idea is that some guy named Bohr, or whatever, 100 years ago, came up with some notion, you know, well, let's uh, figure out what an atom is, and, um, you know, because they figured out that it was electrons and protons, and, you know, the whole thing was starting to, they have enough pieces to start drawing a picture, and, um, you know, an understanding that there was this nucleus that had a whole bunch of stuff in it, so it's kind of hard to drag that thing around because it has a lot of stuff, more stuff in it, technically, for complex atoms. And then you have a, these little electrons buzzing around, and there's a kind of gravity in the sense that these are charged objects, right? So this is a plus, and this is a minus, so that's like gravity, it's attraction. And so you prevent the thing from crashing into it by giving it motion. And, um, you know, then they figured out that the motion was quantized. And this is sort of the beginnings of the word quantum, I suppose, is that you had this quantum leap, okay, <laughs> to another orbit. And that the orbits in between just didn't work. Uh, the electron's not going the right speed or it's the wrong distance, whatever, but... The point is, is they created this idea of an atom, and then they came up with this bizarre idea that when atoms are sharing electrons, it's the same electron as doing some kind of crap like this, you know, and doesn't make a lot of sense in the sense that, well, what's to stop this atom while the electron's way over here? What's to stop this atom from just leaving town? It doesn't seem like a very good way to bond things together. And then when you do it more complexly and you have two of these things, you know, then it gets even more sloppy because now they have to race around this track at exactly the same speed and they have to, you know, it's just, it gets very convoluted. And the positions get all wacky. Now, if there's two of them, then one of them, you know, they're in these weird positions and it creates all kinds of imbalances. It doesn't make much sense. So, um, I don't know what you would call this, an electric uh, version of an atom. But the point is, is that you could imagine that gravity even could work without motion if, like, this had the Earth. And let's just say um, it had, it would have to be more than four for this to work in three dimensions. But the point is, is if it had four moons, you could sort of understand that the, the mechanism might be somewhat similar if you could create some reason why the moons didn't like each other, okay, <laughs> they repelled each other, you could sort of understand that their attraction would be balanced by their repulsion. Now, we know that's true for electrons, so electrons would work, okay, so if I did make an atom out of magnetism, out of monopoles of magnetism, or just call it charge, it's very easy to understand how charges can balance that is the repulsion between things can balance the attraction so all of them would want to be falling into the proton but they would all also not want to get any closer to the other electrons and so you could sort of understand that if this one tries to cheat a little and get closer that's going to 
put pressure on these other electrons in a direction they don't want to go, which is away from the proton. So they're going to resist, and they're going to fight back, and they're going to throw more pressure back at this electron. And so everybody's going to be locked into a position. And this magnetic model can work perfectly fine. And there's no evidence that there was just any debate at all, though, that, you know, physics is much like other human activities, and other human activities led to God theories. You know, that's what human beings do, is come up with wacky stories, and then somehow, you know, the wacky story gets written in a book, and the book gets made out of stone, and nobody can deviate from what the book says. And, you know, even things like religion are such a good example of how frail human intelligence is, because, you know, the stories are ludicrous. And this is the edited version. You know, this is, the Bible's been edited. They've had plenty of time to take the wacky parts out. So imagine the wacky pages they've ripped out, the silly stories, because there's such silliness left in. Um, it's just that bad. And I'd argue that physics is just as bad at the same human um, defect of wanting and desiring and wanting the answer now and being impatient and um, being populist. You know, once something catches on, everybody wants to be part of the club. I'm a pepper, you're a pepper, blah, 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 blah. Um, this whole fitting in thing or something. The whole making icons out of people like Bohr. Well, anyway, there just wasn't any conversation about this story and then the story got wackier and wackier right because then they said okay so now we're supposed to believe the electron isn't in a position that it's some sort of thing okay that can be that is everywhere it's everywhere at once okay it's everywhere at once and you know it just doesn't make any sense because we know the universe is doing something all the time and it can't be everywhere because it's interacting with the universe and it's not going to interact as if it's here and here and here and here and here and here. You know, you could understand if it was a magnet and you pretended it was everywhere, it would be very different than what it actually is in terms of how it would be affecting everything else. So everything has to have an identity all the time. There's, there's no, you know, you can just... Uh, pretend to be a lot of things. You can ghost. You can go at a lower frame rate, right? I mean, if I move it and I have a video at a very low frame rate, you know, it'll have all kinds of ghosts in it, okay? It'll be ghosty like this, you know, kind of crap. But we know at the real frame rate, I'm not in all those positions at once. <laughs> you know, I'm not superimposed. And it's just not a good answer. And so, and there is just, like I said, there's every evidence that there really hasn't been any discussion about um, this duality. Now, wave particle, there's been some argument. Um, I would argue that they've been arguing with um, nonsense versions of particle theory, um, that they really haven't given it any kind of real or valuable consideration in terms of actually. Uh, attempting to make it work because they wanted this wave crap for whatever reason. They're Christians and they really don't want to hear the story of the other son of God. You know, they don't want to hear some competing theory because they're already satisfied to be, you know, Jesus followers. Um, and I'd say it's that's all there is to it. There's nothing, this is all about psychology of humans. It's really you know, and, and again, how easily their psychology corrupts their capacity to do logic and be intelligent and sensible and rational and reasonable. And that's all that's on trial here, is that the fact is that this is just a, a psychological um, mistake um, as much as it is a... Um, well, it just is, because they really... If they actually compared the theories, they would realize, yeah, we're probably way on the wrong boat here, just as they have with gravity, pretending it's not a real force, even though it moves exactly the same speed as all the other forces. I mean, it moves the same speed as light. It's obviously just something that light's made out of, obviously. It's the same stuff. And it's just in a form that's different. You can't tune it in on a radio. It doesn't have a frequency. That's part of this argument. 
that gravity doesn't have a frequency. It doesn't take its, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to give you time in between the pulses to relax. You know, I mean, light's pulsing, okay? Um, gravity doesn't pulse. It doesn't give you this, oh, okay, you can relax now, you can relax now. You know, gravity is happening all the time. And so this whole idea that people, things are in superpositions, you know, they're in all these positions. And then when they have an interaction with the universe, all of a sudden they decide, no, I'm here. This is where I really am. You know, when, when something hits it, you know, in one of its superpositions, <laughs> you know, uh, which doesn't even make any sense. But let's just go with their silly argument. That somehow the, intera the, the universe re interacts with it, and now it's real. Okay, so only when it's interacting is it real. Well, gravity is acting all the time. Okay, it's acting on everything, constantly bombarding it. And there's no time for you to have a superposition. There's no time for you to be, I'm in all places at once, and then I'll be in one place when I get hit by gravity, and then I'll go to all places at once until I'm hit by gravity. I mean, it just, there's no room for it. And that's why, fundamentally, there are two basic theories. Their theory of the atom and gravity, and their theory of... Uh, quantum mechanics are incompatible because this idea of superimposed just doesn't work. And let's understand, I mean, you know, there's just, the truth is so ugly. So when you really go look at the truth of why they believe stuff, it's really ugly. And so this really is just about mathematicians, again, also taking over. So instead of using words like force and understanding concepts like a bit, you know, and uh, uh, <clears throat> even understanding frequency, you know, as being, oh yeah, the, I, I rolled the bowling ball and then I waited a minute and I rolled another one and then I waited a minute and I rolled another one. They're rolling after each other and there's a distance between them. You know, any logic like that, they've turned it all into some mathematical model, some model that's, you know, Lambda time, you know, over C divided by, you know, you know, the square root of P, you know, kind of crap. So they're using this image, mathematics, that really isn't the real thing. <clears throat> because it can do all kinds of things you can't do in the real world. Um, negative zeros and stuff and, uh, you know, infinities and all kinds of other nonsense that don't have anything to do with what reality can produce. So... Uh, mathematically, <clears throat> what they figured out was is that you could take any vector, you know, anything that's moving from point A to point B, and you can dissect it. You could arbitrarily decide that, oh, it's not going straight. Okay, how much in the straight? You, could, you can dissect this velocity, okay, this vector, into two other vectors. You can say it has this much in this direction. You can say it has this much in this direction. So you can bisect it into two other things. So you can kind of pretend, oh, this thing is really this and this. So somehow this and this met each other. So this was going one place and this was going another place and they hit each other and stuck to each other and they became this. But they're really still this and this somehow. And that's how superposition started essentially is it's just playing with vectors and pretending that every vector, everything that's a straight line, is somehow made out of some of this and some of that. You know, I could do that to every single straight line in space around me and I could say, oh, it's really not a line going this way. It's really a portion going this way and a portion going this way. <laughs> you know, um, but it's not the truth. It's not reality. It's just the game you can play with math. You can pretend lots of things and imagine lots of things, but those things aren't what it is, uh, okay? So anyway, back to the, the basics of atoms. So, um, I, as I pointed out, the, you can come up with mechanisms. So understanding an atom, first you've got to understand the... Well, we could draw that in, actually. What do I do with that? I just put the piece down, whatever. Where is it? I just put it down. Oh, there it is, hiding. All right, so uh, maybe I should do that in white, uh, right? All right, so let's say that's the, the nucleus of an atom, and then you can understand that the atom's got these constituent parts of uh, protons and what they call a neutron. Now, I don't have another... <sighs> 
now I really don't have another I just dropped it uh, well I guess I could use the other for a neutron um, yeah you can almost see the difference so um, so they had it's protons and neutrons that make up these these uh, nucleuses of atoms and they figured out that the neutron you know so they have this theory that you know so if you've got more than one proton in here the fact is is they know this thing is really small because when you try to hit it, it's really hard to hit and um so they know these things are really close to each other and the argument is is they know they have a huge repulsive force between them and the obvious thing to think is why are the neutrons in here in the first place what do they do right they don't seem to have a role because they don't have a charge so they can't play the charge game so what are they doing well they seems kind of obvious that they're the things mitigating the repulsion between the protons somehow the neutron gets involved and it negates what would be this tremendous pressure between protons and so now you can have two protons really close to each other so they're essential to the function of the nucleus uh, being a small thing is the fact that the neutrons exist and then when they found out when they can do some sophisticated experiments blah 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 that neutrons can be broken into a proton and an electron and i dropped the electron chalk so we'll have to use this instead yeah that shows up different enough all right so that's really what a neutron is is a proton and an electron now I've argued in 2 plus 2 plus 2 physics that you know this is pretty easy to explain if you use two forces and you understand that the fo the pink force would the red force would leak out of the electron perpendicularly and then if you understood that the electron force if there was an electron force it would leak out of the proton perpendicularly and you could lose all the pressure between them and now what they call the strong force which means they were thinking there has to exist some very strong force that's forcing the protons together well there doesn't have to be a strong force because you're just letting the force you're letting the push out from in between and therefore the push on the outside will take care of smashing them together and getting them very close and so it's a simple way of understanding how the the neutron mitigates uh, and allows protons to be close together now all of this the creation of what we call atoms happens inside of suns as far as we know uh, that's their theory i'm not saying there's anything wrong with that one um, and we understand that suns have tremendous pressure they're big things the center is lots of pressure lots of heat and um, so the idea would be is that these there are certain configurations of these protons and neutrons uh, that um, are durable so they're they're built inside pressure and you can understand that in pressure you know there would be a, um, a you know the idea is is you could you could arrange things you know I could take two protons let's say <coughs> and um, I could take an electron and the repulsive um bits you know repulsive bits of energy that leave perpendicularly you can almost understand that they would have no free they could be stacked and they could be force little force bits stuck here so like ping pong balls you know i have used the analogy you can take two ping pong paddles and you can understand if the ball had perpetual motion that the closer i bring the paddles the more pressure it creates just by interactions even though you have only one ball bouncing back and forth you can essentially make more energy by just bringing the paddles closer together well inside of suns you could imagine that this could happen and that the this, this perpendicular rule happens which we sort of know happens just because we know the whole right hand rule of all electrodynamics is sort of made out of the idea that you send a force in one direction and you get a force coming out in the perpendicular direction um, so it's a concept that clearly exists in physics. Um, but anyway, so if, if inside of a sun, you can sort of imagine that there would be a whole density of this force and that there actually wouldn't be any frequency here, or it could be insanely tight. So unlike like ultraviolet light might look like this, infrared light would look like this, you know, the distance, okay, very distance gets closer and an X-ray would look like this. And you can understand that, yeah, well, there's nothing really stopping it from being even closer together and being even more little quantas of force stacked. And um, 
And if such a thing happened, this, this would be acting like a spring, essentially. You know, this would be energy going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it's pushing, you know, the protons away. And it's also moving the electron side to side. And that this is a little uh, machine inside of atoms, this little mechanism, this little collection of just a a neutron and a proton, uh, essentially, right? I mean, here would be the neutron, this would be the proton added. And that this little machine could do all kinds of things. It can overcome drag, it can do lots of things. So I'm just saying, but that's what was built in the sun. And then you can see that this has a component, right? This, this compressed force, this idea that the force is really close together. And you might even understand that if I broke this atom, that is, I imbalanced it, and I screwed it all up, and I knocked a piece out here, and did something to damage it, that this spring energy, this energy that was moving, you know, through kinetics, back and forth, <coughs> would end up being free, and if it was free, okay, uh, and it's all going in a direction, well, you might confuse that with a particle, right? you might think that's energy moving particle, because it's going to hit something and move it. Okay, very fast, very quickly, because it has a lot of little points in a row. High frequency, very high frequency. And that's what they've seen, and that's what they have, you know, they call all of these other particles. Like this could be a, what, you know, a neutrino is some piece of this. You know, um, all the other uh, fermions and uh, tachyons and plachyons and all the 400 zoo particles they've made are probably just this stuff. You know, you break apart a nucleus and you're freeing a bunch of energy that was created inside of a sun in the sense that it was compressed inside of the sun. This high frequency was created inside of a very high pressure sun and that's the arrangement. So there's only a hundred elements there's only a hundred ways to arrange this stuff, so I'll go back to the arrangement argument and why the magnetic model, um, and I say magnetic, but it's it's made out of charges, obviously, but the charges behave just like magnetic monopoles. You can think of a charge as a magnetic monopole, right? I mean, a charge will behave, if I, if I could make, okay, magnetic monopoles, if I could make um, a magnet, I could break it in half and have a north end and a south end, it would be exactly like everything about their behavior would be exactly as we describe charges. Magnetism is the same thing, okay? It's the same basic mechanism. It's just if I could take an electron and proton and I could just stack one on top of the other, and let's say they were the same size, just for the sake of argument, I'd have a mini magnet. This would be north south. I mean, it would just be a magnet. Okay, there wouldn't be it wouldn't behave in any other way differently than a magnet. So if I just stack charges, I've created a, a little magnet, a little tiny magnet. And if I stack a bunch of those charges, you could understand just like a regular magnet, I could make the magnet bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So the relationship between magnetism and electricity is just so obvious that whatever's causing electrons and protons to act at inversely to each other is exactly the same mechanism that's causing magnets to act inversely to each other. There's not two different forces, there's just one force, and it's just a fact that you can, in fact, make atoms into magnets. Okay, so let's go back to the model. So what I'm saying was never really debated, or there's no evidence that was ever a conversation about it. So you have the idea of the nucleus. So let's understand it's it's made of two times the number. So let's just forget about neutron as a word and just understand that a neutron is a proton and an electron. So it has two X protons in it and you know just one X of electrons. So it does have some electrons in it. It's just that it has twice as many protons, which means it has a net, okay, um, positive. Uh, charge. It's decidedly more south than north. Okay, so let's just understand it as this is the south pole. Um, even though it does still have electrons in it, it does have some negative. It just has twice as much positive. And that the electron uh, isn't a composite 
So it isn't a nucleus. It's just one little object, and one little object that has a negative charge, and there's absolutely no evidence that it's anything other than that, um, that you can break it into anything, subdivide or any of that stuff. So if I did have these charges, and I, they did have force between them, that is, they had energy, ping pong balls stacked up between them, you know, so these were repelling constantly, and... Um, these were attracting to the positive. Okay, the negative attracts to the positive because all the all the green energy from this electron leaks out of the proton and all the red energy uh, here would just leak out of here. So obviously there'd be low pressure between the electron and the proton and high pressure between the electrons and the electrons because they're just reflecting. So again, you have to just understand that the two properties are if pink energy hits, if red energy hits the red thing, it just reflects and causes momentum this way. If green energy hits, okay, it goes perpendicular. That is, the green energy will leave this direction when it leaves, and it will cause momentum in this direction. So it just changes the dimension that the uh, momentum just exchanges the dimension. Uh, not a huge... Um, Thing for it to happen. But anyway, not, not a uh, gigantic mystery that there could be some mechanism that causes that. It's not a very sophisticated thing to do, it's merely churn right. Uh, so anyway, you could understand that this simple model would work in the sense that if you put pressure on this electron, okay, you're going to get, the whole system is going to fight back in some ways. Different things will happen. You'll create more attraction to the proton as you moved a little bit this way. That means you're going to create even more impulse to move, but you're going to be pushing against these electrons who don't want to go away from the proton. They're going to fight back, but they're also going to end up moving a little bit this way or, you know, and towards this electron. And this electron's not going to like that, and he's going to move this way. And this proton's going to move a little bit this way, and that means the force on this electron is going to get weaker, and it's going to be able to move that way even more. And then this electron is shared by another atom. Right, so and you can understand that if I put pressure on this electron, I will eventually put pressure on this electron, which is being shared, which means this electron will do the same, this, this atom will do the same thing, and it will transmit, again, movement of this electron, will move this electron, will move this electron, and you can understand that that could be electricity, you know, crudely defined. But what happens in the process of that electricity, you know, that movement of pressure, is that the shape of this atom will actually change, right? So, so it's nice and balanced, and instead it's going to become for a short, I'll exaggerate the image a little bit, for a brief period of time while you're hitting it with force, what it's going to have happen to it is that the outside electrons are going to get further away, right? They're going to go further away. This one will get closer, okay, and this one will get further away. And so you're going to have now a polarized atom. You know, you're going to have from this direction, it's going to look more negative, okay, because you brought the electrons closer to the observer. From this direction, it's going to look decidedly positive because you brought the electron closer, uh, further away, um, less close to the observer, therefore weaker as a force. And so the proton staying where it was, so to speak, relatively speaking. It, the proton can't move. Remember, the proton's a big, heavy nucleus, so it's not going to move as easily. So it's going to have a static position. And the electrons are going to do the wobbling, more wobbling. So the, well, anyway, from this perspective, you'd see a positive. From these two perspectives, you see a negative. And from this perspective, you're probably going to see a negative. But you can't see this perspective because this was the shared electron, so you're not going to see that perspective. Nothing's going to see that perspective. But so anyway, you see it's polarized now. So, so it's essentially created a magnet. It's essentially made one side, okay, one, this going th anywhere looking this way is going to see a north kind of look, okay? It's going to look northy, and this side's going to look southy. Okay, so I should do that in red. Um, so you can understand that by shaping, by misshaping the atom, I can change its polarity. I can make it look like a magnet for a second. And that that's what actually happens inside of 
uh, materials, uh, conductors especially, when you shove electricity through them. You're pushing on the electrons. The electrons misshape the atoms as it, as it transfers the pressure. And so um, the more atoms you, you affect, the more magnetism you will create. So that sort of explains that when you have a big conductor and it's full of atoms, if I put a very high pressure through, it'll convey all the energy through just a couple of atoms. But if I put a low pressure through, but a high amperage, that is, I force it to give me, uh, um, yeah, I just put a high amperage. That is, I pull a load that's pulling lots of electrons out, okay, but it can't, um, uh, then I'll affect more atoms. So if I can make the electricity hit more atoms by increasing the amperage, then I can create more little magnets. So just think every time the electricity hits the atom, it's going to misshape it and create a little magnet for a second. Well, if I'm creating, if I'm turning this into a magnet, and this into a magnet, this, 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 if I'm turning all the atoms into magnets, you can understand that that's going to be a lot of magnets, and I'll see the magnetism. But if I do a high voltage and only affect a few atoms, I'm not going to see very much magnetism. And the other thing to understand is magnetism is just a filter, so it's really hard to talk about atoms and these kind of things. So there is a video just on the subject of magnets. And um, understand that the external force is constantly hitting everything. And what a magnet does is it just does the misdirection thing. It just causes energy that was going one way to all go another way. So when the green energy hits, it gets reflected off the green end. If it hits this end, it ends up going out the green end. Okay, well, I should have put it this way to point out the perpendicularness. So all green energy comes out one end, and all red energy comes out the other end. And it won't be all, just a higher percentage. You can make a strong magnet or a weak magnet, you know, depending on what percentages you're able to convert. Um, and it's just additive. So if I put a bunch of these little magnets together, they all do the same thing. They all tend to push the red this way and all tend to push the green that way and create more and more segregation of the external gravity force that's affecting them. So essentially the energy for magnetism comes from gravity. It's merely taking gravity, which is purple, and it's converting it into blue and red. And by converting it into those, by segregating those two forces, you can push electrons and push protons um, by that inversion. All right, so the other thing to say, I could get, I, it's hard to just stay on the subject of the atomic structure just because the structure has so much to do with uh, the other subjects. So again, you don't need a model of uh, swirling stuff, stuff moving all over the place. All you need to understand is everything is jiggling, everything's in tension. There's a huge tension between the positives, the protons and the electrons. And, uh, you know, there's just this, everything is just locked into position. So you can understand, if I had this magnetic model, um, I, can, I can have everything stabilized. I can have them in geometric positions that are stable. And let's understand, there's only, you know, a hundred or so of these. So in all of geometry, there's only a hundred configurations that actually are durable, that, that survive getting out of the sun. So, you know, it is kind of a rigid geometry, but you can understand if I could make this stable, okay, that it all kind of works. You know, the, the pressure here is equal, you know, to the pressure in, and so it just stays, everything stays in its position. That if I were to go, if I was to add another electron out here, you can understand that there would be a stable condition. And at this distance, you know, I can't draw everything to scale, but this distance would be twice this distance, right? because the force is getting weaker, right? So you'd understand that, yes, there would be these orbitals. That is, I could add electrons out here and out here and out here, and I could also have stability, okay? Because the repulsion from the electrons hating each other and the attraction to the proton would, again, keep this all stable. And I could go out another layer and, and be able to keep an electron in a stable orbit. And that, um, you know, that's the, the nature 
of um, the mechanism. And it really is going to be dependent now with small atoms is where this gets complicated because you're saying where's all the extra pressure and where's the balancing pressure. So I guess I'll try to give you a, a brief uh, explanation. So when we think of this um, nucleus part, <clears throat> and we have electrons and neutrons. Well, when we only have one electron, I mean one proton, okay, and one neutron, well, we're really just saying we have something that's really hard to make into balanced, right? I mean, I could draw it like this. I could draw one a neutron and one proton like this. And then we could <clears throat> uh, say that that's the nucleus of an atom, like hydrogen or some other silly thing. And... Um, Clearly, it's imbalanced. There's no way I can balance it. There's no way I can. There's no way I could say it looks the same from this direction as it looks from this direction. You know, it's 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 a complex thing. So obviously, I could though theoretically add another electron here, right? And if I added another electron, what would I be doing? Well, I might be okay. Now I'm creating attraction here and attraction here um, you know to both of those sides but I still have the repulsion well, I should have drawn that this way in green and maybe use white for the well it doesn't matter but you can understand there could be repulsion here and then attraction going this way so as this moves into a balanced condition you could almost understand that this electron would actually move out here and now you'd have a balance okay but you'd have an incredibly polarized okay this would be decidedly south and this would be decidedly north at these two ends and it would be decidedly south at these two ends you know from perspective and then but you could understand that you can just keep adding and just reconfiguring the nucleus right the nucleus is going to change when you start changing the simple atoms so then you could go to helium and then you could go to lithium and you know you, you're talking about a a small number of electrons and protons in total and it's just the fact that now the nucleus is not going to be as real a thing okay it's not going to be you know you're not going to be as easily it won't be as easy to tell the nucleus from the rest of the bits but you will be able to tell when you start adding more and more pieces then this part gets smaller and smaller and this gets tighter and tighter and that's what happens inside of suns suns make atoms out of atoms suns take this okay and put it you know compress it and then put stuff around it and that's what can happen inside of suns because it's a very energetic place lots of uh, lots of force lots of pressure uh, all right so let's see is there anything else so yes yeah, so the other thing would be is you could also understand how the bonds would make much more sense between atoms so you can understand that if with a magnetic model you solve a lot of problems you know with this like say if there's two two places uh, you know that are and the other atom is missing you know it's an ion so it's missing these two so it has all these other pieces but it's missing these two. Well, then you can understand how they could share those two if these two aren't moving. Okay, the sharing becomes kind of strong and obvious. So the atoms are sharing, the bond's really strong. And so you can understand how it's going to be, you're going to have to hit something pretty hard to break this bond, okay, to the um, proton here. You know, the protons and protons. And, um,. You know, so sh the idea of of strong bonds versus weak bonds makes a lot more sense when you don't have all this stuff spinning around. Again, if it was spinning around, how would these two atoms know to stay together? Because this green thing wouldn't be here. It would be over here. How would this stay anywhere near this atom when it's constantly been bombarded by the universe? It just really doesn't have any energy to stay here because it's going to jiggle itself free while this is over here. It just doesn't make any sense, and vice versa. So you, th you know, the static model, the magnetic model of the atom, just works so much better. And um, the nuances of any kind of oh well, what about? And oh well, what about? And oh well, what about? You have a lot more chance of answering all those oh well, what abouts with a magnetic model. 
and just understand what conventional physics has done is they've just said I don't even have to answer any what about questions because I'm going to do this I'm just gonna say it's everything you know it's magical it can do this it can do that it can do anything I want it to do when, when they do this to it you know when they cloud it <laughs> okay that's just saying it's magical okay it doesn't have to it doesn't have to be accountable for being actually here are actually here you don't have to account for anything because you can just say oh no it wasn't really there it was over here and make it work um, so it just avoids any of the real physical problems and the reality by just turning everything into blob physics um, and it just it's so unconnected to what the universe appears to be which is very consistent and very mechanical it's um, you know the dominoes have to be in their place or they won't fall it, the rules are rigid and um, in a sense the system is very perfect it just doesn't have room for ambiguity um, in terms of the function stuff has to be exactly where it's supposed to be again you know you, you have well you can you can use different examples. I mean, just think of radio waves that have got huge, giant wavelengths of, you know, three miles. And all of this stuff has a real direct impact on something and a consistent impact. Like, it always does show up at exactly the moment it's supposed to. And this always happens exactly when it's supposed to. And there's just such a huge consistency to how the universe functions. It just doesn't have any ghosts. It, there isn't any magic except in the magic of our l lack of, of frame rate. We can't see the real universe. We can only see that really slow version of it where everything is ghosted. And that's the fact. The universe isn't really ghosted. We're just seeing it badly. And frankly, we're smart enough to see it correct. We're smart enough to know the ghosts exist. The ghosts are not a reality. The reality is that everything does have a position and everything does move in straight lines. That's the real mechanism. The forces have a consistent behavior. Um, you know, it takes the exactly the speed of light time for the force to get from point A to point B in a free environment. And if I make the environment a little bit messy, then I know that it's going to take the force longer because the force has to move an electron from here to here. And that's got to move another electron from here to here. And that's got to move another electron from here to here. And that will absorb time. So the more electrons I have to move, the more time it's going to take for my force to get somewhere. I mean, that's the obvious explanation. The silly explanation is to say somehow the force slowed down. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't know how to get there. Now, there's actually a cause for the fact that the force takes time and the time is to move these little bits and moving the little bits polarizes things causes different effects to the universe that you know and the point is is there hasn't been any any willingness for physics over the last hundred years to take the challenge to explain why their theory defeats all of this. They just use silly analogies and say particle gravity is impossible because more rain hits you in the face when you're running into it than hits you in the behind and some other little thing and they just say that's it we're done. We're not going to bother even trying to understand why uh, it would be possible that electrons could have raincoats. You know that <laughs> there could be a reason why uh, that uh, effect is not catastrophic to the function that it can in fact be an explanation and they haven't even tried to look for them um, it really is they want to believe in gremlins and they don't want to hear theories about how well you know people drop socks and then they kick them underneath the dryer or you know they just don't want to hear stories about how you can lose socks and it doesn't have to be a gremlin that stole them um, and because they're they're Jesus believers. They, they want Jesus to be the answer. They don't want it to be. Uh, they don't want Mohammed to be the son of God. No, that's, that doesn't sound right at all to them. Only because they've decided what team to root for. They're a Yankee fan. They really just can't imagine, what, I'm going to root for the Cubs? Ew. <laughs> you know, they just can't. 
they can't get comfortable with it psychologically. This doesn't really have anything to do with, again, the real argument is, is what team is better, not what team should I root for. Um, and what set of facts makes more sense. Uh, a mechanical universe made out of straight line forces that move the speed of force, not the speed of light, the speed of force, and that light is made of force. It's made out of clumps of momentum, out of frequency. It is not made out of any stupid wavy crap, you know, that has a gigantic polarization of 2,000 atoms that somehow affects an electron. No, these little bits are the photon, and these little bits can be scattered, and they can hit electrons in different locations, and you can take a bunch of these little bits and scatter them, and some of them will all land in the same place again and cause a new photon, and cause a movement of an electron. Their momentum can be scattered, but their momentum can't be destroyed. And, <clears throat> yeah, it's a, uh, all right, well, anyway, it's probably enough um, of a, just making the point that the magnetic model never really even tested never discussed. They just went with Bohr and said we're Bohrites and Bohr, 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 a uh, gravity swirly model. And there's just no reason to believe in the swirling model. Um, and again, it just doesn't make any sense. Where does the swirling energy come from? Where, where did the electron get its speed from? And how did it get just the right speed to just stay in the right <laughs> orbits and all that? It just doesn't make any sense where the charge model works because the charges are always consistent. They're elemental, and they're always consistent. So you can make consistent geometry. And it explains why there's 100 versions, you know, 100 ways to stack the geometry and make it durable, make it capable of moving into a no-pressure environment outside the sun and still stay in one piece. Yeah, I think that's enough. Uh, so, till the next time and such, and so forth and whatnot.